modern era, the unalloyed. And they made him a lord, not for virtue, but for might. Such as a lord, I suppose. Seek strength. The rest will follow. I hope these words seem legible to you, dearest friend. My hands have been trembling something awful these past few days. I guess that's to be expected after so many lifetimes of gore, after so many wars have been fought. Remind me, old friend, did we win? Have we ever won? I recall victory, but there was no exultation. And if we've ever wanted anything, then why am I still fighting? Still fighting the same enemies by different names? Shouldn't victory ever necessitate change? But you are not here, are you, my friend, to answer me so? Perhaps I ask you these questions so that I can dream of your answers. Perchance that you may answer them, if not for mine, but for your own sake alone. Let no cries of triumph be chanted upon the battlefield. So long as any manner of lord is left standing, a hunter's work shall not be done. A pound of gold for a pint of blood. One of the most mysterious figures in these lands is the demigod known as Mikola the Unalloyed. Even his title seems a matter of debate among scholars, and that, I believe, should be a good place to start, as analyzing what it means to be unalloyed might serve to attain a general sense of what his goals may have been and what they may have become. From the records related to the incantation Radigan's Rings of Light, we learn that the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. Within this context, it must be noted that fundamentalism is synonymous with the tenets of the Golden Order, and I would also like to posit that, given the common association drawn between gold and grace, the term unalloyed gold implies a pure form of grace. Presumably without all it had absorbed in the past, which would include the rot that consumed his sister. From this, the most intuitive conclusion is that Mikola's rot-free grace could serve to heal Melania, making that his overarching goal. But even if that really is how Mikola began their quest, that would not remain true for long. Something that piqued my interest was the fact that young Millicent only blossoms into a scarlet flower if the golden needle is lodged inside her body. That needle is said to be a ritual implement crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods, and it is thought capable of forestalling the incurable rotting sickness. This is what they think, and this is what they say. But regardless, the fact still stands that, at least for poor Millicent, there is no fate without rot, and there is no flower without a needle. This, in turn, led me to take a closer look at that needle I had retrieved from Melania's blossom. More specifically, its secondary purpose is what interested me the most. True to popular belief, this artifact's ability to ward away the so-called meddling of outer gods can be used to sever the connection that would force a tarnish to rise as the Lord of Chaos upon reaching the Elden Ring. But you see, the needle only severs the influence of the outer god. It doesn't end our connection to the flame of frenzy itself. This was clearly demonstrated to me when, after having used this needle with such a purpose, my touch was still capable of setting the finger maiden Hedda ablaze with the power of the frenzied flame. There are also the records connected to Melania's technique, the Scarlet Aeonia, which state that each time the scarlet flower blooms, Melania's rot advances. It has bloomed twice already. With the third bloom, she will become a true goddess. This means that it was known, or perhaps I should say expected, that Melania's rot would lead to a form of godhood. In the land of reeds, clean rot has a meaning closer to exalted rot, a display of reverence towards rot that befits such a conclusion. And so, given all previous revelations, and given the ultimate ambition of all demigods, it becomes more likely that Mikola's goal had shifted away from curing Melania into advancing her condition. The purpose of Mikola's needle was never to remove the rot from Melania's body. It was only ever meant to grant her control over it. By means of providing her the tools to stave off the influence of the god of rot, without denying her the power she derived from it, Mikola would facilitate her ascension into a god in her own right. I dreamt for so long. My flesh was dull gold, and my blood rotted. Corpse after corpse left in my wake. Another major aspect pertaining to Mikola's goals is embodied by the Halic tree. 
It is widely accepted that Nicholas Halick tree was meant to be an alternative to the aired tree, even though it would still be grace-laden. The implication being that Mikola's goal was to purge the Golden Order and the impurities of grace while ultimately remaining subject to the same outer god his mother had served before him. But the conclusions we reached about his goals regarding Melania call this conclusion regarding the Halic Tree into question as well. This common knowledge interpretation of Mikola's objectives would have been merely a facade hiding their true intentions, a lie which can be gleaned from Halic Tree soldiers who carry this sacred light and when weakened, explode to deliver a last-ditch attack. It is said, This was the bitter revelation discovered by the desperate soldiers who awaited the return of their lord. In the end, despite what they may have been told, their sacred light was no blessing at all. So now in order to unravel Mikola's designs, we'll follow three lines of inquiry regarding Mikola, Melania, and Moog, all leading to the same conclusion. Despite what most scholars seem to believe, Moog didn't kidnap Mikola. They were working together all along. Regarding Mikola On the surface, it would seem Mikola's relationship with blood came at the end of his journey, but it doesn't take much digging to find out he'd been dabbling with the idea for a very long time. First, it must be said, Mikola's Halic tree had been watered with his own blood since it was a sapling, not exactly the kind of practice one would associate with a grace-given demigod in the search of pure gold. And that wasn't all the blood was used for. Bewitching branches are blessed with an incantation of unalloyed gold, and even produce Mikola's crest upon use. But interestingly, they are crafted using sacramental buds, which are buds cultivated with youthful sacramental blood. And the only other item crafted with these buds are the preserving boluses that help against the onset of rot, further connecting the manipulation of blood to the realm of things related to Mikola. Generally speaking, locations where these buds can be found should indicate sacramental blood of some kind has been spilled there, but some locations may hold more meaning than others. One such place of particular interest for this subject would be an Altus Plateau, where a group of them are found growing around a statue of Mikola and Melania, of the same kind found in the Halic tree, in front of which lies the amber starlight. If the stars command our fates, then amber-hued stars must command the fates of the gods. Given the statue in the way Saluvis describes this shard, saying, to think this was once a demigod's very fate, it can be surmised this shard is specifically associated with Mikola. This scenario represents Mikola abandoning grace in favor of blood. It is either a figurative representation or even arguably a literal one, wherein Mikola would have cast aside the grace within, of which a pale shard yet remains, in an act that is the mere opposite of his brother Morgoth having recanted his accursed blood. Now all of this serves to associate Mikola with the usage of blood, but not necessarily to Moog and the formless mother, but there is evidence to that end as well. There is a sword monument in Altus Plateau that reads, the first defense of Landell, a sovereign alliance rots from within, traces yet remain of bloody conspiracy. The very wording on this inscription hints at an association between rot and blood, and circumstantial as it may be, its placement helps to link Mikola and Moog, too. This monument is located near the Second Church of America, where a sanguine noble prowls, the same church where I was invaded by Leonara, Yura's last hunt. Not far from the church and the monument, we can also find the writhe blood ruins, where another sanguine noble can be fought alongside dogs and slimes associated with Mogwin. The presence of the Lord of Blood in the plateau is otherwise hard to explain, but all this creates a clear and direct connection between Mikola and Rot to Mog and Blood. Mikola's golden tree was nothing more than an overgrown blood rose after all. A small side note here for the record. The so-called first defense of Lindell wasn't actually the first, but rather the second. The first one was against the dragons when Grand Sachs breached the capital's walls. Just another reminder that history is relative to the memory of those retelling it. Regarding Melania Stray, my dearest Stray. Melania's participation may be overshadowed by Mikola's and Moog's ambitions, but I'd be remiss not to remark on her prowess the blade of Mikola. There aren't many masters of the sword like her. To see her fight, it's like she's dancing. When you look upon her blossoms, 
You feel as if you're being drawn into the depths of a scarlet abyss. Rarely have I been so beguiled or so afraid. Having fought her left me scared in more ways than one, and I would not wish the experience on even my most hated of foes. But alas, her contribution to this scholarly exploration comes not through her strength. It comes from her southward march instead, a campaign that culminated in the Battle of Aeonia where Melania and Radan found themselves locked in stalemate. Now Caelid is on the other side of the continent from the Halic Tree. If they marched there, they must have had reason to do so. First impressions would indicate a war for territory and or the acquisition of great ruins given the context of the shattering and all, but neither of these fit the evidence I was able to procure. You see, despite the presence of the Aired Tree in the Elden Ring, they didn't try to take the capital during the so-called first defense of Lane Dell. Surely there must have been some fighting there, but they didn't siege the city in an attempt to conquer it. They simply left through the passage in the ruin-strewn precipice, which is indicated by the path Millicent later takes when retracing Melania's steps. There's also no sign of them trying to take over Liurnia, and Melania fought against Godric the Golden, but they didn't bother conquering Limgrave either, all of which indicates this was not a war for territory. And I should add that according to Kenneth Hite, Godric was the one who provoked her into a conflict. She even spared his life after her inevitable victory, and even more telling, they left him with his great rune. This makes it perfectly clear, does it not, that Melania's march was undeniably not motivated by the acquisition of great runes. But what drove her then? Well, she eventually reached the Caled Wilds, and Caled being the end of the road, so to speak, means whatever they sought after had to be there, since there was nowhere else left to go beyond that point. But as we have just concluded, they weren't there for either territory or great runes. In a baffling decision, they seem to have crossed the entire continent in a march that mirrors America's campaign in the Age of the Crucible, but with no particular goal in mind. Studied in isolation, I believe no reasonable explanations could be found here, but if we consider the possibility of an alliance between Moog and Mikola, previously hinted at by the association between Mikola and Blood, then gaining access to Necron and the Formless Mother becomes the reasonable explanation I was hoping for. To support this conclusion, I'd like to present that the presence of an eternal city throne in Celia indicates there used to be a surface eternal city in this location, that the presence of two Nox citizens combined with the myriad spells associated with the night that were developed in Celia indicates there still exists a connection to the eternal city that lies underground. And lastly, that the final battle against Radan may have taken place on the coast, but the swamp of Aeonia, where the Scarlet Rot first bloomed, is next to Celia directly on top of Mogwin's palace. Even with all his might, the Red Lion General was nothing more than an obstacle to be overcome. Their objective was never something as mundane as a sword fight or the meager bounty of a great rune. Mikola's ambitions eclipsed even Radan's wildest dreams. Another small side note here that reads, I think the first impression upon meeting Commander O'Neill is that he served under Radan, Given the placement of his counterpart, Commander Neil, as guardian of Castle Soul, which housed half the Halic Tree Medallion, it becomes more likely that O'Neill served Mikola and Melania as the sole veteran who remembers the Battle of Aeonia with pride. Regarding Moog As I had stated, many a scholar believe Moog to have kidnapped Mikola, a conclusion undoubtedly spurred by a spirit in the consecrated snowfields preceding the waygate that leads to Mogwin's palace, who says, Moog, you rotten omen, your blood is cursed. Give him back. Give Lord Mikola back. How dare you lay hands on such precious flesh? But as demonstrated by means of the truth the Halic Tree soldiers eventually learned about their precious sacred light, Mikola's designs weren't all known to his followers. In fact, the words of this spirit show the whereabouts of Mikola were known to the people of the Halic Tree, meaning they could and arguably would attempt a rescue. But Melania and all of Mikola's forces are simply waiting for his return instead. As I awaited his return. The placement of the Wigate itself supports the idea Mikola wasn't forcibly taken, since Moog would have to have traveled the entirety of the Halic Tree, starting from its canopy, in order to reach Mikola and an incursion of this scale would most certainly have left obvious signs behind, but there are none to be found. Wishing to raise Mikola to full godhood, 
Moog wished to become his consort, taking the role of monarch, which is the role previously occupied by Godfrey and Radigan, albeit with Mikola having replaced Merica and while serving blood instead of grace. And this goal really isn't entirely compatible with the idea of Moog kidnapping Mikola either, is it? Both Moog and Gideon talk to and about Mikola as if he were still alive, slumbering. Some expect him to awaken, others hope that he won't. So in order for Moog to become Mikola's consort, the most reasonable assumption is that Mikola had accepted Moog and the blessing of the formless mother instead of the rule of grace. Regarding Morgoth, Moog, and their great runes, Moog's rune is soaked in accursed blood from his devout love for the wretched mire that he was born into far below the earth. The Fell Twins were never a part of the royal family, not even at birth. They weren't exiled into the shunning grounds. That's where they were born. That's where they were bound by shackles bathed in golden magic, so potent even their faint remnants still bind them to the ground. It wouldn't be unreasonable to assume they'd have needed help in order to break free, nor that they would have needed help to acquire the great runes that blessed them. But there were no thrones set aside for them in the sovereign alliance that followed the Knight of Black Knives. They were not welcome in Lindell. It seems unlikely that they would have gotten help from one of their siblings, but I believe there to be evidence indicating that is precisely what happened. The first defense of Lindell wasn't an all-out battle for conquest. Melania only passed through on her way to Caelid. There are no signs of a siege or full-scale war, but her march left signs nonetheless. Once I'd made my way into the capital, something that caught my eye were the piles of ash scattered about. Granted, Landell later transforms into the ashen capital, but ash was already present before the burning of the aired tree. My first impression was that it was coming from Grand Sax's body, given the dragon's mineral association to gravel stone. But there are places where ash can be found that wouldn't make much sense in that context, such as next to the aired tree sanctuary, which is too far above the old capital for ash from Grand Sax to have settled there, and the path to the Grand Lift of Rold as well. At this point, I must confess, despite my curiosity, I hadn't been paying all that much attention to these questions. Prowling in the streets felt somewhat familiar to me, even though my prey was so much different. I let myself be inundated with memories, perhaps longing for the blood-drunk fervor of the hunt. That is, until past and present became too much alike in my mind's eye for comfort, until memories of old Yarnum and the howling screams and the singeing flesh all came for me. What triggered this episode, I believe, was noticing the heavy presence of perfumers, i.e. healers, in the capital. You and I both know healers always follow the sick and the sickness spreading from them. There are also many buildings whose doors and windows have been sealed shut. Some still have knights standing guard outside, as if waiting for something to break out from their confinement. The picture was all too clear, dear Stray. The whole city was in quarantine. It had been in all probability an outbreak of scarlet rot, and the ash formed from their efforts to contain it with fire, in the same manner as they're still doing in Caelid to this day. This explanation suddenly makes sense of the ash-covered path between Laindell and the Grand Lift of Rold, which connects to the hidden path to the Aelic Tree whence Melania certainly emerged. And it also raises a question regarding Lower Laindell. Why is there so much ash and destruction in that area? The downfall of Grand Sax is sure to have caused damage to the city, of course, but surely these structures would have been rebuilt in the time since the routing of the ancient dragons. No, the destruction we see here is much more recent, and it coincides with the accumulation of this accursed ash. The convergence of rot and destruction in this area indicates Melania fought a battle here, but why here of all places? Well, this area just so happens to connect to the shunning grounds where Moog was imprisoned. If they chose to make a stand here, even if just temporarily, this seems to me like the only reason that could justify such a decision. The Fell Twins didn't free themselves. Mikola freed them. From there, the path to the Divine Tower that houses the great runes bestowed upon the Omen is the same one that leads to the Lift of Rold, the same one Melania had already carved her way through. And on the way to that tower... Something happened I can't quite explain just yet. In the blink of an eye, I found myself lost in a vast stretch of darkness, wherein I was beset by two omens. 
In retrospect, that seems to have been a memory of Morgoth and Moog prior to the acquisition of their great runes and the transformations they wrought. The fact these omens called themselves the Fell Twins was, in all honesty, a dead giveaway. And their weapons also support this idea, since their powers mimic the weapons wielded by the Veiled Monarch and the Lord of Blood. Morgoth was likely offered a chance to join them, since he also performs attacks with flame-imbued accursed blood, just like Moog, hinting that he may have initially accepted the blessing of the Formless Mother, before eventually siding with the Eared Tree. As I said, I can't quite explain yet how I was able to interact with this memory, but it is worth noting that remembrances hewn into the air tree do customarily allow for the transposition of both knowledge and physical objects. This incident was definitely atypical, but the mechanics surrounding it are certainly not unheard of. And lest I forget, I should mention that Moog's great rune is the only one meant to affect individuals in other worlds, and is probably the instrument that allows them communion with the Formless Mother in the first place. And so, my friend, with all this evidence laid bare, our conclusion becomes pretty straightforward, doesn't it? From Mikola's early involvement with blood to his ulterior motives and everything surrounding Moog, when the prodigal son returns, the lands between shall bathe not in rays of gold, with rivers of blood. The veneer of sanctity is often thin, and oh, how the grace given have fallen. Deathless Slumber Now that we've properly established the nature of the relationship between Mikola and Moog, I should like to tell you in passing about another mysterious figure, Saint Trina, whom I believe to have been an alter ego of Mikola. Unfortunately, there is no conclusive, direct evidence supporting this theory, but on the other hand, though, there is no lack of circumstantial evidence either. I'm not usually one for intuitive conclusions, as you might remember, but in this case, in this particular case, I feel confident enough. When it comes to Trina, the only certainty is that their appearance was as sudden as their disappearance, but their presence can still be felt all throughout the lands between. We are all here familiar with Trina's lilies, for instance, which are somewhat of a counterpart to Mikola's lilies. Relics of worship are rare, but not unheard of. And there are even a few surviving texts denoting crafting techniques left behind by her followers. One of which is a particular interest to me, for you see, the crafting recipe for Mikola's bewitching branches comes from a fever's cookbook of all places. Now I consider that to be the most conclusive piece of evidence in this matter. But once that connection is made, one can't help but start noticing unending references to slumber on everything surrounding Mikola, with Trina herself, of course, being primarily associated with powers that induce sleep. Mikola's unalloyed needle causes slumber before healing. Finlay carried the slumbering demigod Melania all the way back from Caelin to the Halic Tree, where she continued to await Mikola's return in her sleep. Noticeably, Mikola sleeps in a cocoon in preparation for godhood, and there are also the wolf rider Albinorix who are associated with Mikola. The blue silver they are known for is said to be a metal born of the same mother as the archers themselves, which is a reference to their matriarch, Philia, who is also lost in a deep sleep. If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all will be well. Gideon. From this conclusion, we can surmise that the forsaken ruins in Caelid, where I found the sword of St. Trina, to be an indication that Mikola's influence had already infiltrated that region in advance, further corroborating Mikola's goal had always been located there. And besides having used this identity to disguise their movements, Mikola may have researched the powers associated with sleep for a more specific reason. One of the many peculiar sights in the Eternal Cities are the Nox Ant Riders. But the thing about their relationship is that the Nox never tamed or befriended the giant ants. They compelled their mounts with magic, which is indicated by a distinct purplish glow in their eyes. But once they've fallen under the drowsing effects of, let's say, a sleep pot, they will shake off the glow and break free from bondage, proceeding to immediately attack their riders. This implies a connection between sleep and mind control, and provides the seed for Mikola's bewitching powers. And finally, in a matter of much confusion, some say Trina is a comely young girl, others are sure he's a boy. One way or another, Trina is consistently described as a very young person, with people going so far as to describe a depiction of them in adult form as unnerving. In my mind, this characteristic harkens back to Mikola's curse of eternal youth, 
though androgyny being more commonly associated with those who are still young of age could be used to explain the discrepancy in the accounts regarding Trina's gender, there is another possibility which has enthralled my imagination. As previously stated, the power of rebirth is a part of the Elden Ring, as exemplified by the great rune of the unborn. Being Marika's child, Mikola appearing as both a boy and a girl is likely to be related to the same power their mother uses to shift back and forth between Marika and Radigan. This power of rebirth has also been previously linked to the Eternal Cities and the events that have enabled, among other things, the creation of nascent butterflies who share Mikola's appearance of eternal youth. This same power may also have been what Mikola hoped would rebirth them a god by fueling it with Moog's accursed blood. Two more side notes from the writer, saying, Trina's sword is described as silver in English and as white in the land of reeds. Translations aside, it still holds the physical appearance of this metal, which is associated with the Albanorix. And in the land of reeds, fever cookbooks are called cookbooks of Ferris. The identity of Ferris seems to be a mystery unto its own. The Grand Alliance when I first teased you about the mysteries of Mikola, how deep did you think we'd be going, my friend? I don't know what you were expecting, but I can assure you most demigods aren't half as puzzling. Perhaps I should strive to pick a less extensive tale for my next letter, but at least for now, we still have much ground to cover. And the next order of business in bringing you up to date is to expand the list of culprits to include Rikard and the Academy of Raya Lucaria as well. Connecting Mikola to Raya Lucaria there are two main connections relating the Academy to the Halic Tree, and quite arbitrarily, I shall start by telling you of the Albanorix. Despite having met them first in Liurnia, the Albanorix are primarily associated with Mikola, Albanoric wolf riders of the Guardians of Ordina, Gateway to Elphael, and the elders of the village of Albanorix hold reverence the Halic Tree as their promised land. Though it is worth noting, Liurnia is probably their original home, since the elders are unlikely to have made a journey from the Halic Tree and also that Loretta, who originally served the Carrion royalty, ended up in Elphael after a long, bloody journey to seek out a place where the Albanorix could live in peace. Now I've had the honor of meeting one such wolf rider by the name of Latena, who came to Liurnia in search of something called a birthing droplet. But even though she was alone when I found her, even her wolf companion was gone. She wasn't the only one to have made the journey to this land. On the outskirts of the Academy Gate Town surrounding Raya Lucaria, there lies the ruins of a place known as Temple Quarter. There, not only did I find the body of an Albanoric like Latena, but also a chest containing an ice rind hatchet, one of several gifts given by Castle Soul in the distant north. This creates a clear connection between Castle Soul and Raya Lucaria, but considering Castle Soul held both the left half of the Halic Tree secret medallion and a spirit asking for Mikola's forgiveness, and the implication is that these Albanorix, who also served Mikola, had dealings with the Academy as well. With the Empyrean posing as a common factor and the leader of both factions, I think it's reasonable to assume their business at the Academy was, in fact, Mikola's business with the Academy. And the second connection between Raya Lucaria and the Halic Tree, I believe, can be made through Mikola's St. Trina alter ego we just discussed. First, there are sleep-inducing crabs all around the village of Albanorix, and a tree surrounded by Trina's lilies that seems out of place, too. One on Caria Manor's rampart, and a few in the consecrated snowfield, and another one inside Raya Lucaria, just past the debate parlor. I trust the village of Albanorix and the consecrated snowfield are self-explanatory at this stage. Caria Manor will be explained shortly, don't worry. And the one in Raya Lucaria serves to bolster the connection between this institution and Mikola. There's also an isolated merchant in Raya Lucaria with a very curious inventory given his surroundings. He sells a fever's cookbook, Trina's lilies, and St. Trina's arrows. This merchant must have procured these items from somewhere, and I believe they were acquired from a delegation of St. Trina's envoys sent by Mikola. From this same merchant, you can also purchase the blue cloth set, which can be associated with the blue dancer charm in Melania. Records of the charm speak of a blind swordsman with a flowing sword who defeated the god of rot. The records pertaining to the flowing curved sword contain the following passage. Legends speak of a master with a sword garbed in blue and his curved blade that was patterned after flowing water, with strong attacks that unleashed a series of strikes akin to a dance. 
and the color of the blue cloth set is said to symbolize brisk waters as fluid and flowing as the sword in the hands of its wearer. So here we have all three items, the cloth set, the charm, and the sword referencing each other, with the flowing sword serving as the link between the charm and the set. And finally, Melania's signature skill is called the Waterfowl Dance, the name that harkens back to both the dance-like techniques of the blind swordsman and the flowing water references made by these records. And though the series of connections may run a little long, the important takeaway is the fact that the set, the charm, and the sword are all connected to each other, and that Melania's technique calls back to the legend they describe. Now, just as the set is sold by a merchant who strangely also sells items related to St. Trina, I found the sword in a hearse in the consecrated snowfield where a second nearby hearse was found to contain St. Trina's torch. And I should note that the location of these funeral marches is particularly relevant considering the secretive nature of the path that leads us there, implying a stronger connection between the items they carried, the sword and the torch, and Mikola's presence as it pertains to these fields. Regarding the sword, I believe its owner to have served as Melania's mentor at some point. Martial arts are traditionally about more than merely fighting, so given the legend that inspired the swordsman's dance-like techniques, which speaks of defeating the god of rot, then his teachings were likely directed at helping Melania control the rot within her, attaining self-control through dedication to a martial philosophy. In the end, the juxtaposition between the merchants selling the blue cloth set along with St. Trina's items and the procession carrying the flowing curved sword along with St. Trina's torch indicates Melania's former master was a part of the delegation sent by Mikola to Rai Lucaria, the same delegation that was accompanied by Albanoric archers from Ordina and that carried gifts from Castle Sol. The academy isn't a desolate battlefield, but there are signs of battle nonetheless which must have been fought against Ranallo's loyalists, and in which a legendary swordsman must have died. And even though I do believe these connections are more than enough to demonstrate a collaboration between the Halic Tree and the Academy, I'll make just a short note regarding a couple more items sold by that isolated merchant. First, there's the fanged imp ashes, which are used to unlock the Albanoric Rise in the consecrated snowfield a tower guarded by Rai Lucara marionette soldiers, where the graven mass talisman can also be found. And at long last, the festering bloody fingers sold here are another indication of the alliance between Mikola and Moog, given the context of this merchant's inventory, that is. Hmm. This missive seems to hold more side notes than the previous ones, though I suppose that's to be expected given its length. Recording two more notes now. The warrior that taught Melania is not to be confused with the blind swordsman described in the legend of the Blue Dancer charm. The original warrior that inspired the legend was most likely a Nox swordstress wielding a Nox flowing sword. The warrior that taught Melania was later inspired by that legend. And This argument is rather circumstantial, but just like the shambling corpses in the Halic tree have become carriers of spores and inflict rot, the same corpses in Raya Lucaria have glowing blue eyes and can drain one's focus. Given the association between the Academy and Mikola, and between Mikola and St. Trina, it could be argued these Academy zombie-like creatures are an indication of experiments aimed at grafting sleep-related properties such as draining focus onto living creatures. After all that, it must be said that it was a mutually beneficial relationship, before I move on to talking about Reichardt. Both parties had something to gain by working together, which should make this proposition all the more reasonable. First, by ousting Renala and moving against the Carrions, the Academy can pursue monopoly over sorcery in these lands. And since Rani is an Empyrean, the Carrions also compete with Mikola for godhood. By associating himself with Raya Lucaria, Mikola can delegate the fight against Rani and focus on his own ascension instead. Also, Carrion influence extends to Celia Town of Sorcery, making them another competitor to be crushed by the Academy. This influence can be deduced from Selian sorceries and seals, which have Caria's royal crest on them. And Battle Mage Hugh is imprisoned inside the Celia jail, but even though he's originally from that town, he became a Battle Mage in Raya. So in order to get to Celia, the Academy would have to traverse Godric's Limgrave and challenge Radan. An alliance with the Halic Tree not only provides the manpower necessary to undertake this task, it also provides the cover needed to maintain the Academy's veneer of neutrality in the Shattering. And as previously established, Mikola had plans of his own in Kaelid. 
And lastly, despite having access to the blue glintstone in Raya Lucaria's crystal tunnel for usage with their staves and spells, the Academy is stockpiling purple glintstone associated with gravity spells instead. Back to Celia, I found both Roxling, a gravity spell, and the meteorite staff, which boosts gravity sorceries in the streets of Sage's Ruins just outside town. Now, Sages are generally described as heretical, and as having been driven from town, though these ones probably weren't exiled for practicing gravity sorcery, since Redan himself wielded gravitational powers which he learned in Celia. In any case, this haven of dissenting sorcerers may have been used by the Academy while summoning a meteor shower onto Celia which was stopped for the most part by star Scourge Radan. Besides helping Raya destroy Celia, the meteor shower could also potentially help Mikola reach the town's underground, bringing him that much closer to his final goal. And finally, two more notes at the end of this section as well. Regarding the sleep-inducing crab in Caria Manor, at first the alliance between Mikola and Raya Lucaria would seem to give context to the placement of that enemy as well, given Raya had launched an assault on the manor. But the truth behind it might lie elsewhere. Sleep is primarily associated with St. Trina and Mikola, but Rani has developed some rudimentary control over it as well, as demonstrated by the sleep mist she deploys when meeting us at the Church of Ella. The mist is subtle, but its effects can be perceived on the nearby merchant Kale. I wouldn't even have noticed it myself had it not been for a dear friend telling me about it, a friend who, oddly enough, looked just like you, Stray. And the last one... The blue-white wooden shield found at the entrance to Raya Lucaria is said to represent the stars of the night sky portending fate. Strangely, though, two of its symbols on the shield are the exact representations of Moog's crest and great rune. The other two are the star mentioned in its description, which also looks like a snowflake, and a yet unidentified one, though I suspect it might be a waygate portal. Given its placement, color pattern, and description, the shield could represent propaganda regarding Mikola's plans, a prophecy regarding the rise of the Mogwin dynasty, or even a map to Mogwin Palace. Connecting Mikola to Mount Gelmir The last member of this alliance that we need to speak of is Reinhard, and though arguments start simple enough, things quickly get deeply tangled, so let's get started, shall we, old friend? Located at the end of a ravine between the Altus Plateau and the Volcano Manor lies the Shaded Castle, which, according to a map fragment I've acquired, is considered part of Mount Gelmir. The manor and the castle also share an unspoken professional relationship. The Inquisitors of Volcano Manor find the guilty, and the Executioners of Shaded Castle deal with them. Malay Marais, the Shaded Castle Castellan, was beguiled by the beautiful and fierce goddess who was born into rot. His castle houses clean rot knights, a Valkyrie's prosthesis, and a hall dedicated to Melania. Needless to say, a connection between the castle and the Halic tree is a given, and given this castle is considered Mount Gelmir territory, that connection should, at least in theory, extend to Reinhardt as well. To corroborate that theory, let us first consider that, despite all the prominently displayed prostheses in Shaded Castle, there is no reason the Halic tree couldn't forge their own. Especially considering only Valkyries seem to have a need for them, since clean rot knights' armors and gauntlets indicate they didn't use them at all. This unnerving hall, lined with unalloyed limbs none shall ever wear, isn't a production line. It's a shrine. The original design, however, may have originated in Gelmir. The level of expertise required to develop this technology can likely be attributed to a certain genius who created the pulley bow and crossbow, a resident of Mount Gelmir, living right next door to this very same castle. Next, I need to tell you of one Elimer of the Briar, the man who replaced Malay Marais as head of the Shaded Castle. Something about the story I've heard of him irked me to no end. In the records of the Marais Executioner's Sword, it's said that Elimer was a convicted criminal who snatched this sword from the site of his looming execution. It is then assumed by most that he took over the castle by force, but that part is never explicitly stated on any records I could find. And don't get me wrong, Elimer was a formidable foe and worthy prey for even the most hardened of hunters. But I have a real hard time believing you would have been able to single-handedly overthrow the castle. I knew there had to be more to it. And I believe to have since found the answer I was looking for, which I shall now share with you as it does provide more context for the subject at hand. Elmer hails from Aokade, a lesser long-vanished domain. Little historical evidence remains from that land, but I was lucky enough to come upon the records of one of its surviving relics, a sword known as the Regalia of Aokade. 
Of this sort, it is said that its copper coloration is not to be confused for rust, but is a conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone. In their original version, written in the land of reeds, the kanji, translated as copper coloration, is actually an alloy of copper and gold, known as red gold. Given here in these lands gold is illustrative of grace, this alloy could be said to represent processes of both amalgamation and transition between differing forces. Furthermore, rust is written in the following manner. While the kanji that was translated as rust in these records means rot or decay, which is broadly a synonym but not enough to be considered a mistranslation, and even though it's not the same kanji used to describe the lands between this particular brand of scarlet rot, rot is still the meaning being conveyed by this word. So in the end, it seems like these records would have been better translated as something along the lines of, the red gold is not to be confused for rot. Now the sword's damage scales with one's innate arcane abilities, while arcane itself is reminiscent of the Eternal Cities. The briars Elmer is known for are associated with blood magic, and since the regalia of Eocaid has been mentioned alongside rot, then a combination of both creates another link, this time to the period of rot and blood that followed the immediate collapse of the Eternal Cities, preceding the rise of the Sun Realm. And there's another line from those records stating that swords of Eocaid dance through the skies, which, when combined with the fact its material is used as conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone, gives us an insight into the means by which Faramazula was made to hover above the ground. Gravitational powers seem like the most logical explanation as for how that city was made airborne, but no direct link has ever been drawn in that regard. There are mentions of gravity in its destruction, but not its creation. So the red hues of that sword's powers could be associated with destined death, but that seems a bit circumstantial, doesn't it? Though by looking through the records of the Gilded Great Shield, we find a quote saying, The red tinge in the gold coat mirrors the primordial matter that became the Erd Tree. Since the Erd Tree has grown out of the Great Tree, then the same Great Tree is likely what primordial matter is a reference to, and the red tinge mentioned would be implying that the Great Tree was red-colored before it was grace-given. Along with the previous arguments, this should indicate that Eocheid was likely a part of the Sun Realm, and that this scenario is emblematic of the transition between the ancient, the classical, and the modern eras that we have been discussing for so long. So now that we've established Elmer was from Eocheid, and that Eocheid was a part of the Sun Realm, let's try and bring this discussion back to the Shaded Castle. Given Elmer's briars are meant as a punishment, the ascetics of Eocheid may have revered the old gods and incurred the wrath of the Glomide Queen. If so, this would more easily explain how he managed to take control of the Shaded Castle. The records of the Ansper Rapier indicate Malay worshipped Rot even before he met Melania by saying, Scarlet Rot is an old legend, of which Malay Marae of the Shaded Castle was a private believer. And indeed, he eventually found his own personal goddess. At that point in time, Scarlet Rot was but a legend, rather than something with any kind of tangible presence in the world. I find it likely, then, that Elmer's forgotten religion enthralled Malay, who then commuted his punishment after having been introduced to the ways of the Ron, which exalts the kind of decay and sickness that plagued his bloodline. This provides an origin for Malay's beliefs and makes for a much more believable explanation for Elmer's ascension, in my humble opinion. It also explains why Elmer was allowed to stay in power, considering there were still clean rot knights in the castle, even after Malay had stepped down. And before we move away from the Shaded Castle and into Volcano Manor proper, allow me to make just one last note. Regarding this figurative reading of alloys in a historical context, I would like to remind you of Mikola's very pertinent title as Unalloyed Gold, just in case you should be entertaining the possibility that there's no value in such a venue of interpretation. Now where was I? Ah yes, defiled blood, unlike any humor that flows in this grand realm. To say there are albinorics in the Volcano Manor is something of an understatement. The location itself seems completely out of place for them, and their circumstances aren't any less strange, either. Imprisoned, tortured, and dressed in snakeskin, given the proposed connection between Mount Gelmir and the Halic Tree, Mikola could have provided them to Rikard, of course. These snakeskin albinorics can even be found in Castle Sol, which has already been linked to Mikola in this same letter. But to what end? What is the reason behind all of this? Well, among the residents of the manor, there used to be a perfumer named Carmen, whom I've only met posthumously. Unlike those in the capital, Carmen belonged to the subsect known as Depraved Perfumers, whose counterparts are all found in their previously discussed Shaded Castle. And I think it's worth mentioning that their slow descent into self-destruction seems quite natural, given their lord had embraced rot and decay rather than spurning it. 
Now, Carmen's connection to the manor can be somewhat strengthened by the leaden hard tear I found there, which mimics the effects of the depraved perfumer's iron dry aromatic. Though ultimately, I believe their purpose to have been something much more ominous and strange, for Carmen was rumored to have been in search of a secret physic of revivification. The lord of this manor, Praetor Rikard, now takes the form of a giant serpent that consumed his flesh. This serpent is more likely than not the serpent deity, rumored to have betrayed the Erd Tree in times of old. Its name has been lost to most records, but the inhabitants of Volcano Manor seem to call it Igle, judging by the temple erected in its honor. And just as the serpent vowed to return after I had killed it, its current iteration comes after having been already killed by those who wielded the great spear serpent hunter before me. So it would seem that Igle may require some assistance in the act of rebirth, and this reputed physic of vivification may have been used in the deed, prior to Rikard having fed himself to the snake. And given the apparent connection between Abenorix and the Silver Tears, whose larval tears fuel the power of rebirth, I believe that Abenorix blood was a key component of Carmen's research as well. There's even a depraved perfumer stationed at the edge of the derelict village of Abenorix. And in order to further this conclusion, I should also note that Silver Tears seem to function as a core for abductor virgins, and that one such worm can even be found within Volcano Manor grounds. So having established what Carmen's research entailed, let us now look at some of its implications that might help us link Rykard's efforts to Mikola. First, considering the proposed alliance between Rai Lucaria and the Halic Tree, it is possible this tonic might be related to Latena's birthing droplet, whose nature remains otherwise unexplained. And it would be an exquisite touch of vicious irony, wouldn't it, if the means by which they hoped to perpetuate the life of their people had, unbeknownst to them, come from the death and suffering of their own. Second, since Albinorix are life forms made by human hands, these experiments suggest their alliance was responsible for the creation of at least the second generation, found mostly around the academy, the consecrated snowfields, and Mogwin Palace. Their dumpy heads even resemble that of their black dumpling-wearing first-generation counterparts. These experiments might also explain the origin of the oracles found in the Halic Tree Canopy in the outskirts of the capital. These oracles are evocative of the Albinorix, with their pale skin and non-functioning legs. But unlike the Albinorix who bleed silver, the oracles bleed dull golden blood. They are also associated with the claymen of the Eternal Cities who search for lost oracles within their bubbles, and whose spells share the same name as the bubbles summoned by the oracle's horns. Furthermore, the claymen can also be associated with the Albinorix, first through the fact that they melt away in a manner that is reminiscent of the silver tears, which are in turn similar to Albinoric blood clots, and also because their bubble spells are the only sorceries that scale with arcane, while the Albinorix harbor a secret, they cast sorcery with their innate arcaneness. This chain of connections, coupled with the fact Albinorix were artificially created, implies that the oracles themselves were likely created from Mikola and Rikard's experiments with Albinorix. But interestingly, oracles' horns and skills synergize with faith rather than arcane, and that, it turns out, might have been the reason for their creation in the first place. Though Mikola would have been interested in the opposite outcome instead, Arcane governs holy defense, and in this sense would be tied to Mikola casting away his grace-given nature in favor of blood, a power that is also deeply affected by one's innate arcaneness. And finally, these experiments may have been the process through which he acquired the power of rebirth that is associated with larval and silver tears, which he used to appear as both a boy and a girl, and that was meant to facilitate his metamorphosis into a god. Now the final link I was able to find connecting Mikola to Mount Gelmir came to me after having encountered a godskin noble in Volcano Manor. These apostles can be found in all corners of the continent, though some instances seem more random than others. One such instance that caught my attention was the godskin apostle in Dominula, the windmill village. The spirit at the entrance of the village, whose last words beg not to be skinned alive, gives us some context, but this whole affair taking place in the Altus Plateau at the doorsteps of the capital rubbed me the wrong way. Within the blasphemy of the Volcano Manor? Sure. But here? Something was simply amiss. But then I remembered Mount Gilmir has a village where its now deceased inhabitants also dressed in the same manner as these celebrants, and things started falling into place. The connection between the two villages helped explain the infiltration of such practices so deep within Aird Tree territory, and how Dominula survived Rikard's march on Landell unscathed, seeing that it stood directly in his warpath. This separation between Dominula and the neighboring Lane Dell can also be seen hanging on the firmament, for upon entering the village the ever-looming air tree was hidden from sight by dark gray clouds. These clouds could not be seen from outside the village, 
and the tree could not be seen from within. Such a peculiar feature, so easy to miss and hard to ignore in hindsight. I realized that the same dynamic was present elsewhere, everywhere, even. In the rolling storms of Limgrave and the crimson skies of Caled, above Rai Lucaria and the Moonlight Altar, more than mere atmospheric phenomena, that which stretches above the horizon felt like zones of control, a manifestation of the powers the outer gods perchance live in, that they certainly fight for. As that old adage goes, the sky and the cosmos are one. And all of this, I might add, may have provided me with an answer I long searched for. As I've stated before, I believe the surface eternal cities to have been the ones destroyed by Estelle. All signs point to it. But the lack of a night sky in the nameless eternal city gnawed on my imagination and gave me pause. Well, this phenomenon serves as an explanation for that as well, doesn't it? Just as the presence of the aired tree above ground gives us golden skies, surely the presence of its roots, and later of the Prince of Death, beneath ground, should have an effect not too dissimilar. In light of this, it is no longer strange that the Eternal City would be missing a night sky. Not even a little. Not even at all. Nocron's night sky showcases something along those lines as well, albeit a version of it that is not so intrusive, where the blood star of the formless mother paints the cosmos with shades of a blood-red hue. Going back to the village, the most interesting part for me was having found young Millicent there, confused as ever, yet determined to achieve her goals. As I'm sure I've mentioned, the little girl had placed it upon herself to retrace Melania's steps as she made her way back to the Halic Tree. This then implies the goddess of Rant, too, had visited the Windmill Village, and it opens up another path of exploration entirely. Two other examples of seemingly random instances of godskin worship I hadn't given much thought to were of a godskin noble at the entrance of the Carrion Divine Tower, where Rani's desecrated flesh rests, and the ashes of a black flame monk called Amon, which I found in the catacombs at the perimeter of the hidden path to the Halic Tree, guarded by a stray mimic tear. Just like the Apostle and Dominula, Amon and the mimic tear both seemed exceedingly out of place, especially considering the hidden nature of that path stemming from the Lift of Rold especially considering the fire monks from which he had deserted weren't supposed to have access to that place. But since we've already demonstrated Mikola to have some involvement with the Silver Tears, why then not take this a step further and connect them to the godskin worshippers as well? So we have all these intersections. The Noble and Galmir and Rykard's alliance with Mikola, Melania and the Apostle and Dominula, and also the Mimic Tear and Amon in the path to the Halic Tree. But what about the Noble and Lyurnia? What do you reckon he would have to say about all this? Well, considering his proximity to Ronnie's body, I decided to look toward her for any insights, and lo, that understanding should finally be found. A very small detail that had me puzzled for a while was that I had found around Ronnie's two fingers the presence of that peculiar mushroom growth that is associated with scarlet rot, even though rot is nowhere to be found in this isolated little island in the sky, and even though there are no more of these mushrooms anywhere else here either. And while trying to rationalize the presence of these mushrooms without the rot, my epiphany was realizing that the rot was, in fact, not absent from this place, or at least that it hadn't always been. You see, Rani and her two fingers are antagonistic to each other, to say the very least, and what this scenario indicates is that those same two fingers had aligned themselves with Mikola, who, being another Empyrean vying for godhood, would naturally consider Rani as an enemy, a competitor in the race for the divine the enemy of my enemy, and all that. And that realization finally led me to consider the baleful shadows that stalked Ronnie in the name of the Two Fingers. The one I fought seemed completely alike Blythe in its appearance, with the only difference being that poor Blythe wielded a sword imbued with frost, while the baleful shadow wielded black flames instead. Merica and Ronnie were given shadow-bound beasts as followers, Malekith and Blythe respectively, Empyreans as they were. But Mikola and Melania's shadows are never mentioned by any record, or anyone else I could find. So I contend that the baleful shadows are indeed those two lost shadows forgotten by history. One of them I've killed myself. The other presumably died while trying to assassinate Ronnie in the past, if the black wolf remains I've found behind Siluvis's rise is any indication at all. Beheaded and fashioned into a mask. What a sad end to a once proud beast. Regardless, the fact still stands that these shadows in their weapons and wreathed in black flames serve to associate Mikola to Rani's two fingers, the godskin worshippers, and Rikard's volcano manor. It also helps to explain the black flame engulfed body of Eiji, whose black knife assailants are known only for their vestigial power over destined death. Poor Eiji. Poor Blythe. 
At least they died fighting for something they believed in. Fighting for someone they loved. Fighting for us all. I suppose it must have been a more honorable kind of death, if there even is such a thing. At the very least, it commands more respect from me than those who die fighting to uphold the shackles of their own bondage. Though in the end, I have nothing but pity for the lot of them. For the lot of us. My hatred is reserved for those who would impose such fighting upon us all. And I swear to you, Stray, I'll hunt them to the very last, if I can. Transcript officer number 16 recording another side note. This one seems uh, more peculiar somehow than previous ones in this letter. Most giant ant queens drop Newman's runes, all but one if I'm not mistaken, which are associated with Merica, her kin, and therefore her bloodline. They can be found in both Eternal Cities and the Halic Tree. The former seems to remove the possibility that they're simply fauna naturally attracted to the tree sap of the Halic Tree. They're also not found in the Aird Tree proper. Domnula festivals carry out sacrifices where, besides the skin, runes also seem to be extracted from victims, since all celebrant weapons grant runes upon landing attacks. Dominula means little mistress, keeping in mind that Trina is described as both a young boy and a girl, and is used in the naming of certain insects, including but not limited to the former nomenclature for the Formica sanguinea, which used to be called Formica dominula. This can be further associated with the lands between through formic rocks. The Formica sanguinea ants are slave maker ants. Their queen can either kill and replace the queen of another nest, and or its workers can also steal pupae from other nests in order to fill their ranks. Two processes that mimic Mikola becoming a god that did replace Merica and compelling the affection of her followers into his service. Rune extraction can be correlated to grace extraction, as in Mikola removing the grace within and replacing it with something else, e.g. blood. Sanguinea is the Latin feminine form of sanguinius, which means blood, bloody. It's worth noting that rot is also associated with insects through the scorpion stinger and Melania's butterfly wings, and that both Estelle, primarily, and the falling star beasts, pincers only, have insect-like attributes and a single eye popping out in front of their skulls, which fits how Mikola is depicted in adult form by St. Trina's torch. Elphiel is littered with ant cocoons, and Mikola currently sleeps inside a cocoon himself. I haven't been able to find any definitive conclusions from this series of connections, but I find them interesting nonetheless. The extent to which these pieces of information and their ramifications can be officially considered for the annals of history is still up for debate. Other Connections Before moving on to the final piece of the puzzle that is this alliance, allow me to present to you a short list of secondary connections I found relevant. First, now that we've theorized this relationship between Mikola, Moog, and Rikard, another pattern forms regarding Gideon, who seems to have been keeping tabs on their alliance at the behest of America. He bribed me into chasing after Melania and Moog, but if he cared for the knowledge therein, he'd have cared for Rani too, which he didn't. And if he cared about the great runes, he sure failed to demonstrate that at any point after I'd acquired my second one, which granted me access to the capital. This behavior leads me to believe his interest was directed at the machinations of those specific demigods, so as to safeguard America's designs. And also, I have found the surcoat of one of his men in Rikard's chambers. And while this does undoubtedly mean he had an interest in that member of this alliance as well, we should make note that a spy would not wear the crest of its spy master. That notion is just silly. No, the surcoat indicates his men had been there not under cover, but in an official capacity instead, both of which imply that he once had an official position in America's court, and corroborates my conclusions that he had always worked for her. Another interesting one comes from various invaders I've encountered. Millicent's sisters, for instance, were Bloody Fingers, which helps connect Elphael to Mogwin. The nameless white masks were all recusants rather than Bloody Fingers, despite the fact that they were all located in Mogwin, which helps to connect Mount Gelmir to Mogwin Palace, keeping in mind that the dagger talisman of the white-garbed field surgeons was located in the Volcano Manor. And on top of also being a recusant, Anastasia, the tarnished eater, invaded me in the outskirts of Kalid, Mount Gelmir, and the consecrated snowfield, which helps to connect all three. To continue with the list, Raya Lucaria has abductor virgins, one of which transports us directly to Mount Gelmir. There are abductor virgins in Landell as well, two in the round table hold and one in the sealed tunnel, guarding the way to Melania and Rikard's divine towers, respectively. Mount Gelmir's Albanoric experiments may be the origin for the Albanoric pot of the Academy's Knights of Cuckoo. And the Academy Cuckoos themselves seem afflicted with a kind of blindness reminiscent of Melania's. There are Academy marionette soldiers guarding Volcano Manor, 
though they do not appear in the immediate area of the conflict closest to Lane Dell, which indicates they worry about their participation being made public. There are snakeskin albinorics in the sewers of Lane Dell around the area where the ashes accumulated, and where presumably Melania fought to free the fell twins. Millicent helping us fight Magma Worm Makar implies this is how Melania and Mikola got in and out of Altus Plateau. The presence of the worm and the serpent god's curved sword in the ruin-strewn precipice implies Rykard may have dug the tunnel connecting the plateau to the ravine-veiled village for them. And lastly, a piece that could have been but never was a part of this puzzle, the Dung Eater. As discussed in my previous letter, he may be either an offspring or a descendant of America, and by unifying this possibility with what's been discussed here, we can actually make more sense of the locations where his seedbed curses can be found. They seem to appear all over the place, Lindell, Volcano Manor, Elphael, with Elphael being a particular note given its secluded nature. The thing is that now we know all these places to be related to Mikola in some respect. So considering he may have been a sibling of Mikola, Melania, and Moog, and that the twin prodigies had freed the fell twins from the shunning grounds where he was also imprisoned, it's possible the Dung Eater worked with them for a period of time. This also gives new meaning to his words saying, The Rotten Fools. My fate was the grandest, most brilliant of them all. First, its mention of Rot could very well now be a direct reference to Melania and her cohort. And second, he's comparing his own fate to another undisclosed one and stating his belief that his is the grander of the two. This could mean he wished Mikola to become the god of his curse rather than blood. It also means that his dissenting opinion was likely the reason for their association to end, if indeed it ever happened at all. Deeper Bonds Similarly to the arrangements between the Outer Gods and the Flame Pantheon that I wrote about when discussing the Age of the Crucible, there is the possibility the Outer Gods of this alliance belong to a single cluster as well. Besides using each other to advance their own goals, this provides more context as to why they'd have chosen to come together in the first place. If true, that would make this a more, how should I put it, biologically inclined cluster. Their gods seemingly more parasitic than the rest of their kin with their powers expressed primarily through the effects they have on life forms at a more tactile level. Let me start by saying that despite the god of rot never being explicitly associated with anything other than rot of its namesake, there are clear indications that poison may have fallen under its domain, too. Perhaps the most revealing piece of evidence is the fact that both poison and rot incantations produce the same crest. Also, it should be noted regarding this god's most emblematic worshippers, the servants of Rot, that they can be found in poison-filled environments, not just Rot, such as Mount Gelmir's Seethwater Cave, that they possess a poison incantation, and are known to drop serpent's arrows, and that both the talisman kindred of Rot's exaltation and the headgear mushroom crown trigger their effects when either poisoning or Rot occurs in their vicinity. And lastly, Malay Marais has embraced Rot, but the shaded castle is filled with poison instead. Now, as I've stated before, the snake that devoured the demigod Rykard is more likely than not the serpent deity featured in the legends of old. And despite Rykard not using it himself, that serpent god is still associated with poison regardless. After all, how does one poison a poisonous snake? The poison afflicted nobles in the volcano manor are another hint regarding this connection, and also the aforementioned serpent arrows, which are carved to resemble a flying snake. An imagery reminiscent of the winged snake statues of volcano manor, in the effigy of Eyeglade displayed in their temple. Furthermore, there seems to be evidence of overlap between the power of rot and poison with the power of blood associated with the formless mother. Albeit, I should say this connection is more circumstantial than I'd like it to be. First, the serpent bow was used by assassins known as the formless serpents, and in the land of reeds, both the formless serpents and the formless mother are written using the same kanji, which differs from the kanji translated as formless in the descriptions of various seals. Rot, poison, and blood are all represented by exaltation talismans that work in similar ways. And surprisingly for a giant snake, Rykard's attacks are primarily fire-based, just like Moog's accursed blood is known to deal fire damage as well. Maybe that's just me, but Rykard and Moog seem to have two techniques that are eerily similar when they reach upwards to invoke the powers they embody. Then there's one last connection between Rykard, Lord of Blasphemy, and the power of Moog, Lord of Blood. The one that really piqued my interest. A connection regarding the finger creepers, nightmarish creatures weaved into being by forces unknown. To put it simply, Rykard's hands are literal finger creepers. 
The records pertaining to a strange weapon called the Ringed Finger also alludes to this fact when saying, some life yet remains in this legacy of an ancient act of blasphemy, as evidenced by the barely perceptible warmth that still exudes. And although this revelation provides some context to the process through which these horrid creatures come to be, it doesn't explain everything, and it doesn't explain the more interesting breed of two fingers either. Regardless, finger creepers can be found in Caria Manor, Mount Gelmir, Lane Dell, and the mountaintops of the giants. One way to separate these instances into groups is through the presence of rings, which are relevant because they aren't natural fingers, they are accessories that need to be put on. The ones in the mountaintops have no rings, all others do. This implies that however finger creepers came to be, the ones in the mountaintops did not go through the same process as the other ones did after they were born. Rackhart's connection is indisputable and makes the placement of finger creepers in Mount Gilmir a given. Their presence at Caria Manor becomes understandable considering he was in an alliance with Raya Lucaria, who launched an assault against Carrions and could even have provided gravity glint stone for their rings. And their placement in Landell also becomes more straightforward, since they roam the same area where snakeskin albinorics from Mount Gelmir can be found. But as previously stated, the ones in the mountaintops seem to have a different origin. Something I noticed in that area that gave me some pause is the fact that all the bodies of giants are missing at least one of their hands. This is also the only location I've been to where colossal finger creepers of such distinct magnitude are found. Dearest Stray, I simply refuse to believe that to be a coincidence. Now, despite having fought against Merica and her coalition of frost and grace, interestingly enough, the killing blow to the giants seems to have been delivered through blood instead. That is, considering the thorny vines growing out of their bodies and the thorn blood sorceries that have been divined in this same region, granted by the blood star. I do not yet know how, but it seems to me like the odd participation of blood powers in this scenario has given rise to these finger creepers in the wild, so to speak, born out of the bodies of dead giants. In this hypothesis we've been discussing, where the formless mother should belong to the same cluster as the god of rot and the serpent god, gives us some context as to how finger creepers could have originated from two seemingly unrelated instances, such as Rykard in Mount Gelmir and the giants in the mountaintops. Well, Stray, I do hope these arguments to have been enough, and that you can see as clearly as me the milieu in which these powers exist, have existed, will exist again. And if I were to offer you any kind of final impression of each member individually, I would remind you of the lords mentioned to have served the god of rot, and the implications of an intermediate epoch of rot therein, meaning that power to have been at the top of their hierarchy for a time, while well, the localized configuration of their hierarchy as it can be perceived in our world, at least. Poison and the serpent god, on the other hand, seem to have been left by the sidelines with no clear indication of rule, only an association with Merica that complements the notion blood may have been involved in the war against the fire giants, their betrayal of the Erd Tree, and their eventual downfall. A perfect mirror of Rykard's journey. And regarding blood and the formless mother, I dare say with the anticipation shared by all reckless scholars that the path they tread has not yet ended. For now, Mikola still slumbers. Tis dark and not a soul stirs. But should the god of blood rise to a bloodshot dawn, then from that sleep of death, what dreams may come. Soul Grafting and Spores Now here's a bit of information I wasn't sure where to write in. Wasn't even sure I'd write it at all, given the particulars therein, but here and now, with most of the exploration all but done, seemed like as good a place as any other to do so. I distinctly remember you berating me over the occasional rant between praise in regard to my fear of fungi. But here in this land so distant from our own, my uneasiness has been justified. My cilia are the stuff nightmares are made of, my friend. As usual, there were three stages to this inquiry. Exposure, connection, and revelation. I was first exposed to the question of why fungi when listening to another nameless, long-deceased spirit. I noticed there were mushrooms growing around it. Not regular mushrooms, mind you, if such a thing can be said to exist, but spirit mushrooms as ghostly as the apparition standing before me. Then, upon revisiting previously met talkative spirits, I could confirm all of them had these strange companions around them. But why, though? Why fungi? The question haunted me. The answer eluded me, and I eventually dusted off my feet and moved on with my journey, pretending not to care about any of it at all. Later, with this question lingering in the back of my mind, the connections began to appear. 
I noticed rot seems to give rise to mushroom growth on all forms of biological matter. Trees, dogs, people, and even the bones of bygone giants. Not only that, but Gowrie's ball bearings seemed covered with fungi, and even Melania and her Valkyrie's rot blossoms are very reminiscent of cedar apple rust, a kind of biotrophic fungus. I'd always looked at scarlet rot as a kind of plague in a very generic sense, but with all that in mind, I'd say scarlet rot as it's seen on the environment, e.g. the red-tinged land of Kalid, should be interpreted as the spread of spores, and rot, as observed on living organisms, should be taken as the result of the symbiotic relationship that it develops with its hosts. And I should probably note that just like the aforementioned apple rust, scarlet rot seems to be the kind of pathogen that requires a living host. It'll feed from and disfigure it, but it will not kill the host most of the time. As evidence for this point, I'd like to posit that the shambling corpses in Mogwin prostrate themselves in worship. How much of that worship is from the host and how much of it is compelled is open to discussion, but worship unto itself is a clear sign of sentience. There's even a spirit in Kalid from one such corpse, conveying thoughts as clear as those of any other spirit I've spoken to before or since. Hmm. I wonder what Fia would make of it. So many ways of living in death. When did dying become so complicated, my friend? So now we have spirit mushrooms, a cosmic power spreading as fungi, and we have... We also have the mountaintops, don't we? Melania, and by association Mikola, are connected to Rot, and the path to their halic trees in the mountaintops of the giants, where in a previous letter I spoke to you about the trees. I spoke to you about the death of a deciduous forest, the rise of the conifers, and an event that would have turned the latter into spirits. And I should like to remind you, of course, of the spirit collar cave and the spirit jellyfishes and the ghost of the Albinorix of Ordina that helped set the stage for that event and further connect Mikola to this whole spirit business. So the spirit mushrooms begged the question of why fungi, which gave us a connection to rot. And now that connection begs a similar or almost cyclical question. Why spirits? Is it amusing to you, Stray, that I should be going around in circles thus? Or do you reminisce as fondly as I do upon our late hour conversations of old? Fret not, regardless, for this exploration shall not remain fruitless for long. I assure you answers are coming your way, although the path to them should prove a bit more convoluted than I'd have liked it to be. We will return to Mikola and the mountaintops shortly, but if we're talking about spirit manipulation, then we should also speak of grafting for a moment. In our world, grafting is a technique through which tissue from one body can be transplanted onto another, and most notably for the subject at hand, this term is also specifically used in horticulture, where twigs from one tree can be grafted onto a different tree. Here in the lands between, grafting is used to reference a process through which body parts of different creatures are attached to a host in order to make it stronger. Most people's exposure to grafting comes at the many hands of Godric and his scions, but in my mind at least, the definition of grafting should not be so limited. Revenants and gargoyles aren't explicitly stated to be grafted, but that's what they are. Royal revenants aren't too physically dissimilar from scions, and even the smaller revenants showcase an unnatural number of limbs. And the gargoyles may look like a cohesive creature at first glance, but further exploration of their records indicates they are actually a patchwork of champions as well, a fact that is observable on their faces when they are found without their helms. Now the basic definition of grafting is mostly concerned with the physicality of the act, but what about the soul? Having stronger muscles is good and all, but we both know that's not the source of the kind of power to rival the likes of demigods. No, despite the impression Godric's crude application of grafting might imply, the true power of this technique comes from a symbiotic energy system, wherein new body parts increase the host's power pool and likewise the host gives back to otherwise deceased limbs. This can be exemplified by the gargoyles who are patched up with corpse wax rather than whole body parts, and the living jars who grow stronger with the ever-thickening soup of death lining their insides. The body is merely a medium within which there lies the power they seek. And this, of course, is just an elaborate, torturous way of saying the power of grafting is effectively the power of soul manipulation. So having expanded our understanding of what grafting is, let us now expand our understanding of what it may have been used for. On a baser level, the strengthening of one's physical prowess, yes. But such kind of soul manipulation surely must be more versatile than that, I'd assume. 
For one thing, we could look at revenants again with their obnoxious wraith calling and stipulate that the grafting process may have played a part in their reanimation by manipulating whatever life force may have been left in the body parts used, with the conclusion that they are indeed reanimated being drawn from both their appearance and the fact they all drop ghost glove warts. This through line can be taken further by remembering the similarly shaped Ronnie's doll, which, as previously discussed, was used to graft a portion of Melina's soul. And we could also take another look at our friends, the gargoyles. They are somewhat of a rare occurrence, but in one place in particular there's an abundance of them. Talking, of course, of the nameless Eternal City, where their dismembered bodies litter the location with the stench of death and decay. And this specific scenario raises questions of its own, doesn't it? Where do they come from? Who made them? Why are they here? Well, perhaps they are the answer to another question. And in the process of answering that question, we can find the solution for these ones, too. Besides the exotic residents, headless knights and horses, limbless patchwork companions, and its very own Prince of Death, this eternal city is also home to the root system of the Great or Aired Tree. And as I may have mentioned, the overgrowths of its roots overtaking the city indicates the tree wasn't always as great as it came to be. So I do believe the presence of the otherwise unexplained gargoyles here gives us insight into the history of the tree's development. If grafting is the process of transferring not only bodies, but also energy and souls, then the vast number of gargoyles could indicate grafting was the means through which, in ages past, a tree was cultivated into a great tree, through which it became a siphon for souls. A mirror of this process can arguably be observed to this very day by venturing into catacombs and witnessing the myriad bodies grafted onto the root system, with those bulbs possibly being depicted in the representation of the great tree engraved on catacomb doors. And this process could also explain the jars around most minor air trees, and even those same trees themselves. After the shattering of the Elden Ring, the air tree scattered its seeds, and a process based on the one that had created the tree that became the air tree, i.e. soul grafting, was used to nurture its saplings into what they hoped would become new, future air trees. Now all of this will become relevant to Mikola soon enough. And in order to get there, let's go back to the mountaintops and find a stronger connection, shall we? The spirit trees, jellyfishes, and albinorics of the mountaintops are not the only link to soul manipulation that can be found there. One easily overlooked example of such a thing comes in the form of the primal glintstone blade, with which the old sorcerers would slice open their hearts to imbue a primal glintstone with their soul, and thus did they die. But of course dying couldn't be that simple, right? By helping Selen the Graven Witch, I've learned that the point of a primal glintstone is not the death of the sorcerer, but their rebirth, by means of literally grafting their souls onto another host. Now what's important about this for the purposes of our discussion is the fact that it brings the concepts of grafting and soul manipulation to Raya Lucaria in the form of the School of Graven Mages. In turn, this kind of research helps to explain the marionette soldiers and Ronnie's doll, both receptacles for souls. And considering Mikola's partnership with the Academy, it gives us the connection we're looking for between Mikola and the process of manipulating spirits. And with that, the longest part of this particular venture is over. All that's left is the revelation of why Mikola would care about any of this in the first place. And the answer, I believe, is twofold. First, there's the Halic Tree which quite interestingly seems composed of a tree grafted onto another. So Mikola has been connected to soul manipulation through the Snowfield Spirit Trees in Albinorix, a research likely guided by the Graven School of the Academy. And Melania's Rot has been connected to it by the spirit mushrooms around the spirits imparting words from beyond the grave. And the point of it as it pertains to the Halic Tree would be to use Rot in order to tap into the soul matter usually gathered by the Aird Tree, and then siphon it into the Halic Tree instead. A process reflected by Melania's great rune, which also transfers life force from its victim to its host. A parasite, feeding from a parasite, feeding from another parasite, ad infinitum. And second, a fails rotten waterfalls pool around Mikola's last resting place in the Halic Tree, where Melania awaits his return. So given all the processes described thus far, this fact, along with all the research that led to it, would have been used in preparation for the final stage of Mikola's plan, the transference of Moog's accursed blood and the power of the formless mother unto the unalloyed demigod. 
And there you have it, Stray. I warned you it'd be complicated, and I hope you managed to make some sense of it. But all this talk of fungus gives me conniptions. Let us move on and conclude our discussion of Mikola, old friend. Transcript officer here, and this was a peculiar passage. The writing itself seems firm enough, although I'm not sure how reliable the sanity of the writer may have been at this point, but that's also not for me to assess, so recording some more side notes found at the end of this segment. 1. Circumstantial as it may be, the Revenant's wraith-calling habits serve as a hint to the nature of their creation as reanimated corpses. Also, given their cleric-like appearance and the locations where they can be found, it seems to me they must have been created either by or for Mikola. 2. The location, circumstances, and even the very name of the primal glintstone blade imply this is old. Very old. It implies this technique belongs to the previous classical era of the Glomide Queen, when Merica faced off against the fire giants in the mountain tops. It also suggests we can't really know how old a graven mage, however many of them there might be, really is. 3. The kind of mushroom growth associated with rot can also be found in Noxtella. This seems like a given, considering the Lake of Rot. But in the Eternal City, the instance of such fungus that drew my attention was the one preceding Estelle, natural born of the Void. Having reached that location by following the waters pouring from the Grand Cloister, I'd have expected to find rot there as well, and the mushrooms indicate there was, in fact, rot there at some point in time. But no more. They drip now with some sort of luminescent material certainly brought about by the presence of the eldritch creature over yonder. This fits a previous point I made in the same letter, regarding cosmic powers carving physical zones of influence in the world. 4. And it may also explain the melted mushrooms carried by rotten, shambling corpses. In Caelid, these corpses are on fire, and that may lead one to believe the fire melted the mushrooms, but not only that's not how mushrooms usually interact with fire, there are also the facts that this kind of mushroom is prevalent in eternal cities, and that the non-flaming rotten corpses of the Halic tree carry melted mushrooms as well. The implication is that it may have been believed such fungi could help cure the rotten sickness, but unfortunately, that was obviously not the case. Unalloyed Chaos And so here we are, a place for each piece, and every piece in its place, Mikola's intent and their allied defiance of the Eird Tree. The exercise was strenuous, but the mystery is solved. Isn't it? Yet here we are, and I tell you there is one last piece of this puzzle. For how could Mikola hope to seek Marika in the Elden Ring if he could not burn the Eird Tree? Mikola's needle is believed to have been envisioned as a cure to Melania's rot, but as previously discussed, that's not entirely true. The needle would not see her healed. It would only see her in control of the forces writhing within her body, allowing her ascension into what was seen as a form of godhood. But the thing is, dearest Stray, that is simply not the whole truth either. And forgive me for withholding this from you at the start. We simply needed more context, a better perspective from which to understand what follows. And what follows is the revelation that Mikola, the unalloyed gold, and Melania, goddess of rot, had planned to seize the Flame of Frenzy, and with it, they had planned to commit the first cardinal sin. I, for one, had not begun to grasp this truth until I had acquired the final version of such a needle plucked directly from Melania's Scarlet Blossom. The records left behind for this instrument state that it is capable of subduing the Flame of Frenzy if inherited, allowing one to cheat fate and avoid becoming Lord of Frenzied Flame. However, the needle is as yet unfinished, and can only be used in the heart of the storm beyond time, said to be found in Faramazula. The truth, as it often does, has been staring us in the face, always a single insight away from being dragged into the light. These records are as clear as they are undeniable. Its usage, as it pertains to Faramazula and the Flame of Chaos, is too peculiar, too foreign to their plans. This possibility wouldn't have been known unless it was deliberate. As it turns out, this application was ingrained into the needle's purpose. It was not a matter of happenstance. In order to corroborate this idea, first we should remember that, as previously mentioned, using Mikola's needle did not entirely sever my connection to the flame of frenzy, allowing me to still burn yet all the same. We should also take into consideration the fact that the great caravan huddled around the three fingers, 
not only knew this secretive item's existence, they knew of its peculiar application as well, as indicated by a note I have found among their mummified ranks, saying, The Empyrean Mikola crafted a needle to resist the influence of outer gods. Those who have inherited the flame of frenzy yet wish not to become its lord would do well to seek Mikola's needle. The implication being that Mikola had associated himself with a great caravan, in hopes of locating the Three Fingers. In fact, the isolated merchant in Raya Lucaria, whose wares were previously associated with Mikola, also sells eyes of yellow, and a note leading to the frenzied flame village, wherein lies the corpse of a member of the great caravan holding another note, this one leading to the three fingers themselves. This particular quest of Mikola can even be seen in other areas as well, not just the needle itself. For one thing, Mount Gelmir Albanorix aren't simply dressed as snakes. Their black dumpling masks raise attack power when the wearer suffers from madness, implying Rykard's experiments were also part of Mikola's plans regarding frenzied flame. For another, there's also the possibility Vike, Knight of the Round Table Hold, had unwillingly taken part in this endeavor. When I was invaded by him near the Church of Inhibition, Vike had a fingerprint scorched armor on him while casting a variety of frenzied flame incantations. But later, when I fought him inside the Lord Contender's Ever Jail, he'd reverted back to Dragon Cult incantations instead, even though he still wore the same fingerprint armor, indicating this version had already traveled far below the capital. And it's worth noting the location of that Ever Jail, which is found in the mountain tops of the Giants. Far from the capital in the hold, but close to the consecrated snowfields. So given the area where he ultimately was imprisoned, paired with Mikola's intentions as they've been discussed, it seems to me that Vika was used as a test subject by Megala, as it pertains to one's ability to forfeit the influence of the Chaos Flame. Though Vika's implied loyalty to the Aird Tree and sudden disappearance make it sound like he was made to embark on this journey, rather than having chosen it out of his own volition. And as we know, Megala has learned how to compel one's affection all too well. When it comes to the matter of his imprisonment, I believe the most likely explanation to be that Mikola's efforts to break Vika free from the influence of chaos ironically also severed his own influence over the night. And I must say, all these connections give some context to things that previously I could not understand, such as the prevalence of the yellow annex ruins in the consecrated snowfields, which definitely feel more at home now within Mikola's territory, and whose guardian trolls weren't the fur-covered variant associated with this climate, as I would have expected them to be, a detail that indicates that they were brought here, rather than having been here all along. Such associations also help explain why Lanedale soldiers were afflicted with frenzy on their path toward the Volcano Manor, and why there's one such madness-induced troll guarding the same place. Shabriri, on the other hand, sadly remains a mystery to me. I am sure he must have a role in all this, especially considering he chose to reveal himself to me in the mountaintops of the giants of all places. But what shape his participation might have taken is a question to be answered another day. And finally, these revelations led me to truths hidden in the Cathedral of the Forsaken. I confess that I did not stumble upon this place by accident, spurred in equal parts by Hieta and by my own curiosity. I actively sought an audience with the Three Fingers. What I could not have foreseen was a fight against Moog, Lord of Blood, of whom I had only heard faint whispers at the time. Neither had I predicted the path forward should be blocked by a barrier instituted by Morgoth, the Veiled Monarch. But now... Now I understand that the reason Morgoth had known about the secret resting place of the Great Caravan, and of the Three Fingers beyond that, was because of his previous involvement with Mikola's plans. Incidentally, this also sheds some light on the process through which he was able to recant his accursed blood, since it mirrors the process behind the creation of the Oracles, whose arcane had been replaced with the gold of grace. And regarding Moog, in time I realized the reason for his presence in the cathedral was precisely to find a way around his brother's blockade, as it kept him and his future liege from the chaos they would eventually have needed. The last piece of the puzzle has finally found its place. What a grand mess this alliance turned out to be, huh, friend? But that is to be expected, I believe. The world promised them power. Surely they'd fight for it. Truly exceptional is the individual upon whom power is bestowed only to be forsaken, the rare few who understand that power is the foundation of misery, not to be fetishized, but destroyed. And Mikola was no exception, not even at all. 
like it had been for his mother before him, no bond was too dear, no belief too sacred. In the end, power for power's sake is the only god these peers of the realm are capable of worshipping. Well, let them have their religion of the self, say I. And let them all perish upon the altar they've built with the blood and bones of those who would see them through, who would rend them through. No rest, no mercy, no matter what. For the record, Transcript Officer 16 would like to note there is a plethora of side notes in the last part of this missive, uh, almost as if the subject at hand was too large for the writer to fit into a single string of thought. They read as follows. 1. Going back to the subject of invaders, now that we've established the connections between Mikola and Moog and their plans regarding the frenzied flame, I should also note that, although Eleonora doesn't cast frenzy incantations, she does wield a frenzied flame seal. 2. It could be argued that the statues of Mikola holding a tree branch with a lit candle are reminiscent of the design of the candle tree wooden shield, which is thought to represent a surreptitious prophecy of cardinal sin, and also that the painting depicting this sin being called Flightless Bird could be a reference to Melania as a waterfowl. 3. The four belfries seem to have been under carrion control while they ruled the academy, given the magical properties of the imbued sword keys and the presence of troll knights. But since Renal has been deposed, it's fallen under control of the Academy itself, explaining why these troll knights have become headless in the same manner as mausoleum knights, considering the association between them and Mikola made in Castle Soul, in the presence of the spectral lance ashes of war and Raya Lucaria. These belfries overlook the Chapel of Anticipation, Nocron, and Faramazula. The chapel's importance can be attributed to the fact that it's ground zero for Tarnished crossing the fog into the lands between, and the fact they were keeping tabs on it also explains the presence of an alabaster lord outside the fringe folk's hero grave where, incidentally, a Halic tree talisman can also be found, while the other two variants of this talisman can be found in the Lanedale Catacombs in Mogwin Palace, the catacombs being both relatively close to the Three Fingers and also the location where Esgar, priest of blood, can be found. Nocron would have been a location of interest for the Carrions in regard to Rani's quest, and later for Mikola regarding Mogwin Palace. Faramazula is connected to both Rani's doll and Mikola's quest to tame the Flame of Frenzy. 4. Did he make his choice for his maiden? Or did some other force lure him with suggestion? That question raises the possibility Vika may have been guided by his maiden like we are guided by Hieta, but it's worth noting Vika's finger maiden wore the finger maiden attire, of which it is said that the maidens live to serve a chosen tarnished, sharing their guidance and the wisdom of the two fingers and that the records show of the traveling maiden attire worn by Hieta is much more ambiguous, as it makes no such mention of either Grace or the Two Fingers. This dichotomy implies Vika's maiden was loyal to the Eird Tree, and explains her demise, likely at the hands of Vika himself. 5. Regarding the Yellow Annex ruins, Annex is an antiquated word for anise, a type of flower, and this is how the word yellow is written in the land of reeds, which is read phonetically as the word yellow in English. This makes the yellow annex a yellow flower. How quaint. 6. The merchants we meet are likely not original members of the great caravan. They're more likely descendants and seem to be looking for the three fingers as well. This is hinted at by Kale's dying words, saying, Is this how it ends? I'll never find. As such, they're probably not working with Mikola. One of them has even been imprisoned in Mogwin Palace. Also, the placement of the ones found in Eternal Cities, particularly the one in Mogwin Palace, make little sense to me. These places are too secluded and non-conducive to their trade. This gives rise to the possibility that at least some of them had been following Mikola's movements, in hopes of locating the Three Fingers. And here, in now familiar fashion, is another note in another hand. It reads... A cosmic cakewalk of musical chairs, and us but ants in the grass with just the crumbs. This is all that was written by the former hunter, then tarnished Bob the Hollow, now trading under a new name, in this missive. And their ideas regarding the nature of power and those who wield it seem somehow... No. Such heresies cannot be true. This is Transcript Officer Number 16, requesting immediate sunlight runesmith work. 
Hail in Orlando. Hail in Orlando.